Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm sure a few people will sort of drop in like as we go, but that's just the punishment for being late that you get to miss the start. Um, but yeah, so we decided to do this event sort of in light of some of the recent events. And I think to sort of offer, to try and offer like a broad understanding of like what is colonialism, which is quite a big question, especially in sort of public discussions where it's often ignored and I think sort of erased and whitewashed all at the same time sometimes. Like I remember when I was at school, we were taught that Britain was kind enough to end slavery and build railways in India all at the same time. And so in light of this misinformation, we started our 22 week enrichment curriculum, which is about to go into its fourth af academic year, uh, which is loosely titled sort of race, class and society and runs at two sixth forms in London. And for, for next year, we're going to start with like kind of what we're going to call that like, first five weeks are going to be the making of the modern world, if you like. Uh, and the first session is literally the same as this. It's what was colonialism slash what is colonialism? And the first thing that the students have to do is discuss with one another for five minutes in groups, this very open-ended question. Uh, and it gets like quite an array of interesting responses. These students are about sort of 16, 17. Um, and as we work through the class, we get some, yeah, some, some, some sort of odd comments about the Romans. People sort of gone about the Byzantine empire, which sort of tests my own historical knowledge. I did do like that. I did a module on it at SOAS back in the day when I did my history degree, but I don't really remember it very well. So I'm kind of like, working through that and then we always get the question which i think a lot of people say but when young people say it's in good faith it's a bit different but didn't didn't the romans have slaves as well and questions like that which i think are good and which with young people we want to encourage like the aim is definitely to like encourage those sort of questions and then to debunk them and i think the main goal of the first five weeks of term with these young people is to sort of demonstrate how the colonial project the european colonial project specifically was a unique project and we go from what is colonialism to slavery and legacies, colonialism and modernity, decolon decolonization and the end of empire, and then finally what is race. And then we move from that into more sort of contemporary discussions of what is racism, race, class and Brexit, things like that. And the aim, I guess, is to show that we can't really understand the wider world without starting at colonialism, even when we're discussing things that might seem completely unrelated, such as class, sexualities, gender, and something like climate change, which to a lot of people would seem like like has nothing to do with race, nothing to do with colonialism. And I think that these early sessions for the young people are like foundational and actually like really help understand when move towards it. Obviously we don't have time to do a 22 week session with everyone today. So in this one hour, so two hours, we're gonna try and like do as much as we can. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on the speakers to just like finish it, to answer the question for everyone and to let everyone go away from this with a really broad range of knowledge on the topics. Um, but this could obviously have been a series of events. But today we're just going to have one panel. So each speaker is going to chat for about 15 minutes. Then we're going to break into a Q&A. So if you want to ask anything, can you just put it in the box, in the chat box, and I'll try and get to it. Um, and anything colonialism related, if you have any queries or concerns, just, just put it in the box. But we'll be recording this as well. So it's going to go on our YouTube as a sort of podcast at Race in Britain. I'll put the link in the box as well in a minute. Um, but for now, we're very lucky to be joined by like what can only be considered as an all-star lineup of speakers, a sort of who's who of the post-colonial game, who hopefully will give you some intellectual stimulus going into the Q&A. So I'm going to like start with the speakers. They're going to, this is the order in which they're going to speak in. So we've got Professor Gaminda K. Barnborough. Gaminda is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies at the University of Sussex. She's the author of Rethinking Modernity post-colonialism and the sociological imagination and connected sociologies, as well as co-editor of Decolonizing the University. Then we've got Professor Catherine Hall. Catherine Hall is an Emirati professor of history and the chair of the Center for the Study of Legacies of British Slave Ownership at UCL. I'm gonna put the link to that in the box as well. Um, she works on Britain, race and empire and is currently writing Making Racial Capitalism, Edward Long and the History of Jamaica. She is an associate editor of the History Workshop Journal. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Eddie Bruce Jones. Eddie Bruce Jones is a reader of law and anthropology uh, and, the deputy, and the deputy dean at Birkbeck School of Law, University of London. He's currently writing a book entitled Kyla Fani. Uh, hopefully I've pronounced that all right. Uh, law, Imagination and Colonial Indenture, which explores the lives of indentured laborers from South Asia to Jamaica during the 19th and 20th century. Um, so we're gonna start with Gaminda, if you can unmute yourself, and then you are free to go.
Okay, great. Thanks so much for organising this. And as you're saying, it's uh, appetite time to be talking about these sorts of issues. And I think just to begin, the uh, as you were saying, Amit, discussions of colonialism and empire within Britain usually begin with some sort of denial or request for affirmation that things weren't all that bad. Yes, slavery was bad, but we abolished it after 200 years of profiting from it and then compensating the people who had owned other people. Yes, we know that there were really horrible things associated with colonialism, but it also brought the rule of law and railways to benighted people. It made the modern world, as many scholars argue. The modern world has been made by colonialism and empire, just not in the way that most mainstream historians suggest. So in this short talk, I'll first address the European colonial project, then highlight the processes of extraction in the context of the British Empire, and end with a discussion of the legacies of colonialism and empire and how we might want to respond to this, all in 10 to 15 minutes, so that should be okay. So Europe presents itself as a continent of nations. Its history is, however, one of national projects buttressed by colonial endeavors. Colonial settlement or colonial settlement involving the movement of populations has been one of the most important ways in which Europeans have established their hegemony across the globe. This included both the voluntary movement of Europeans themselves, as well as the involuntary movement of others by Europeans, whether through enslavement from Africa or indentured labor from Asia. European states, most notably Spain and Portugal, followed by Britain and France, were central to these movements. But so were populations from across the continent, including from Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, places which do not often think of themselves as colonizers. Across the 19th century, around 60 million Europeans left their countries of origin to make new lives and livelihoods for themselves on lands inhabited by others. At least 7 million Germans moved to these lands, that is to the settler colonies of the US, Brazil and Argentina. Large scale Polish emigration started in the period after the Franco-Prussian War and by the turn to the 20th century, over 2 million Polish people had moved to the Americas. 2 million subjects of the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary traveled to the Americas, as did over 8 million Irish people, including a million as a consequence of the mid-century famine induced by British colonial rule in Ireland. By 1890, nearly a million Swedes, one-fifth to a quarter of the total Swedish population, was living in the lands that were to become the United States of America. And in addition, 13 and a half million British people moved to white settler colonies across the globe. So to repeat, across the 19th century, over 60 million Europeans moved to the lands of others and in the process eliminated indigenous populations and appropriated their land and resources. Not my phone. As such, not only are European imperial powers implicated in the production of global inequalities, but also broader European populations who by moving to these lands consolidated the manifest destiny at the expense of prior inhabitants. European colonial settlement was not only central to the displacement, dispossession and elimination of populations in the Americas and the Caribbean, but also across Southern Africa, including Zimbabwe and Southwest Africa, now called Namibia, and to Australia, New Zealand and Canada, amongst many, many other places. Imperial rule in India, across the Middle East and in Africa was also constituted through violence and plunder. And these histories similarly require address as part of the processes that have constituted Europe and what we understand as the West more generally. To not engage with the historical processes of conquest and colonization that are central to the nations of Europe, normalizes and legitimates violence in the past as the condition for continued violence against others in the present. That is, the violence of imperial rule and colonial settlement disappears from histories of the nation, happening as it does ostensibly outside the borders of the national state, at the same time as arguments about national sovereignty and national heritage are used to securitize borders in the present and to argue for differentiated citizenship for those with the temerity to move across them. Now I'll discuss the implications of this in the last part of the talk, but I want to talk about the processes of extraction, which I suggest were central to these empires. 
1884, Richard Temple, who was a member of the Royal Statistical Society, produced a report on the general statistics of the British Empire. And in this report, he argued that of the 203 million pounds that was at the disposal of the British state for general government, 89 million came from the UK, including Ireland, 74 million came from India, and 40 million from the territories and colonies and the rest of empire. That is over half of the money that was at the disposal of the government at Westminster came from the labor and resources and taxes of those within empire and beyond the national state. There was an additional tax that was levied on populations across empire for local purposes. This revenue was used by the government in Westminster for the benefit of the nation, despite being derived from the wider empire and imperial subjects. So the idea that most European countries were simply nations generating wealth endogenously, that is internally, is a fundamental misreading of the history that produces Europe. Even those countries that are not explicitly regarded as having been colonial powers, nonetheless partook of the wealth of the European colonial project through their involvement, through the involvement of their populations in immigrationist colonialism and through being the beneficiaries of colonial drain. Now the idea of colonial drain is something that was articulated first by Dada by Naroji in his book, in his 1901 book, Poverty and Un-British Rule. And Utsa Patnaik more recently, by drawing on two centuries of data on tax and trade, has estimated that over two centuries of rule, first by the East India Company and then directly by the British state, Britain extracted over $45 trillion from India. Now, I never know whether people really know how much a trillion is because these numbers are big, but how big? So imagine if I was to give you a dollar a second, it would take a million seconds for you to get a million dollars. A million seconds is about 11 and a half days. To go from a million uh, pounds to uh, a million dollars to a billion dollars, the shift in time would be from about 11 and a half days to about 31 and a half years. So that's the difference between a million and a billion. To get to a trillion at the same rate, getting a dollar a second, it would take 317 centuries. That's the difference in scale between a million, a billion, and a trillion. And Britain extracted over 45 trillion from India. This money, along with that from its earlier colonial initiatives, was used to fund the Industrial Revolution, to fund the building of railways here and across the empire, to endow museums and art institutions, Oxford and Cambridge colleges, as well as public schools. It was also used to set up country houses and estates, many of which are now the responsibility of the National Trust. Indeed, I would argue that there is no institution within Britain which has not been enabled by the wealth extracted from the broader reaches of the British Empire, whether through compensation to slave owners, direct appropriation, or more significantly, through taxation of imperial subjects. Understanding these histories, is necessary to any possibility of understanding who we are today and how we got here. In response to current debates about the removal of statues, the Prime Minister has said, and I quote, we cannot now try to edit or censor our past. We cannot pretend to have a different history, end quote. Interestingly, in the Prime Minister's own book about Winston Churchill, there is not one mention of the famine in Bengal in 1943 in which over 3 million people lost their lives as a consequence of Churchill's policies. Arguing for the colonial histories of Britain to be understood as British history is an inclusive move that seeks to account for the shape of Britain today as a consequence of those histories. There is a need, as Yasmin Narayan argues, for research that addresses the interconnected histories of empire and the detailed cartographies of colonial wealth production and their ongoing legacies. Alongside the excellent legacies of the British Slave Ownership Project, which I'm sure Catherine will be talking about subsequently, I would argue that we also need a legacies of British colonialism project that could bring the more extensive global hierarchy connections into an inclusive frame.
It would be one that would account for the longer histories of appropriation, enslavement and indenture across the British Empire and the ways in which the appropriation and distribution of that wealth continues to determine the lives of those within Britain and further afield. We would need to understand the extent of the wealth or loot brought back by early East India Company officials and track the ways in which some of this money was filtered into wider English and Scottish society through acts of philanthropy and charity. We would need to question the legitimacy of taxing populations and taking the entirety of the funds to another geographical location for the benefit of another population that has not contributed to those funds. We would need to think about the centrality of the plantation economy to the development of capitalism and examine its proliferation across the Americas, the Indian Ocean world and Africa. And perhaps most importantly, we would need to think about how historically produced inequalities continue to structure our societies and what we're going to do about this. So to wrap up, it was the movement of Europeans out across the world and their imperial and colonial endeavors of extraction that have produced the global inequalities and injustices that continue to structure our world. The very global inequalities that provoke some to choose to move rather than to stay in conditions of limited opportunities. To move rather than live with the consequences of already happening catastrophic climate change. The injustices which disfigure the world we share in common can only be addressed through acknowledging the histories that have produced them, as well as the historiographies that have, that have obscured them. This requires reflection on the past, an understanding of how colonialism and empire has configured and made possible our present societies. And it requires what I call post-colonial reparative action in the present. In the context of debates around decolonizing the curriculum, if this is to have any meaning, it is systematically to recover those histories, those colonial histories that have made us who we are and to account for them in the present. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Glinda. I'm sure everyone is clapping on behind their screens. Uh, but yeah, uh, Catherine, are you, are you ready? Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be joining you this morning. And I'm going to say some very similar things to the things we just heard, but I'm also going to turn to a, um, a smaller example, though it's a big example in itself. So I want to say something particularly about the legacies of Caribbean slavery as one aspect of this bigger history of colonialism and imperialism that we've been hearing about. And uh, I also want to. Um, reiterate the importance of the ways in which those histories are living on in the present. They're not past, they're living in the present and we're living with them every day. So I think the, the particular importance of the political moment that, we're, that we find ourselves in now with the combination of the uh, of the killing of George Floyd, of the huge wave of, British, of um, Black Lives Matter demonstrations across the world, obviously hugely in the United States, but also everywhere. The toppling of the Colston statue in Bristol uh, as a demonstration of people's rage at the long contestation over that particular statue and how important it is that it should just go uh, alongside the pandemic and the disproportionate numbers of deaths of particularly South Asian but other minority ethnic groups. All of this has brought us to a crisis around race politics in this society, I think. There are all issues that have long been there, but they've erupted in this moment and become a you know, taken us to a different level of public debate. As Linton Quasi Johnson said not so long ago, racism is part of the DNA of this society that we live in. And it probably has been, he says, since imperial times. And he's absolutely right about that. So we see in this moment, we see a rush from uh, some companies, for example, 
to uh, admit their shameful histories that they've known about for a long time and tell us that they're going to be involved in reparative action. And we see Priti Patel at the Home Office uh, accepting the findings of the Windrush report, which tells us in detail of the appalling institutional racism of the Home Office and the ways in which that instruction of the so-called hostile environment uh, facilitated, enabled the Windrush scandal. So these things are being said, but of course we have to wait and see um, what will really happen, what will really change, and how important it is that pressure is sustained if these changes are to happen. You know, at the very same time that Patel is making this statement, it's still tiny numbers of people that have actually been compensated in relation to their claims of compensation on the Windrush. Well, for the last 10 years, uh, I've been involved in a, um, a project at, at UCL, uh, which has been exploring one way of finding out uh, about the ways in which the wealth from slavery was transmitted to the metropole. It's only one of the routes whereby wealth and power and particular ideas about race were transmitted, but it was one that we could actually grasp and find out about and share that knowledge. So we used the compensation paid to slave owners at the time of the abolition of slavery in 1834, when the slave owners were compensated by the British government, which means British taxpayers, which means all of us and our ancestors, for loss of their so-called property the ownership of uh, men, women, and children who were enslaved. And 20 million pounds was paid in compensation after a long political negotiation, uh, which amounts to, thinking back about the figures that we've just heard, it amounts to about 16 billion in today's money. So it was a huge percentage of uh, national income at that time. And it was paid to 47,000 individual slave owners. And we were able to identify these slave owners because of the archive, which is in the National Archives in Kew, which had never been used systematically before, though people had known about it for a long time. And we were able to explore uh, the British owners in particular, who, what money they got, and insofar as we could, what they did with it. And we wanted to follow those British owners, particularly because we wanted to demonstrate how Britons were directly involved in benefiting from slavery. And as Amit said at the beginning, you know, the story has always been and continues to be that uh, Britain, you know, should be proud of its history in having abolished slavery in 1834. But when we put the story of compensation next to that abolition, and we also recognized the ways in which uh, benefiting from slavery continued long after abolition through, for example, US slavery and Britain's involvement in that, or Cuban slavery and Britain's investment in that. You know, the, the ending of chattel slavery in the Caribbean, Mauritius and the Cape did not result in um, the ending of slavery, not at all. It was just a particular form of slavery uh, in the Caribbean. So our aim was to provide unequivocal evidence which could not be denied of the ways in which particular individuals benefited. And as some critics said at the time, you know, this took away uh, um, attention from state involvement which was obviously crucial. But as I said, it was just one way in of demonstrating Britain's involvement and denying that, insisting that slavery has to do with everyone here, now, and in the past. It's not something that belonged in the Caribbean, 
other is to do with US history, which is how it's often taught in schools. It's actually something that Britain was deeply involved in for getting on for three centuries. So what we were able to demonstrate through this uh, um, investigation was the particular kinds of legacies um, which, uh, which have been embedded in British society. So money, of course, money, compensation money that went into the building of those railways that we've already talked about, that went into the building of the infrastructure for the development of the Industrial Revolution, industrialization, the building of modern Britain. Money that went into uh, buying country houses, uh, rebuilding those properties, buying art uh, and buying books as cultural artifacts, which were ways of demonstrating status and wealth. And that um, many of those pieces of artwork are now in our national collections. And one of the other things that we've been doing is identifying those and working with the Tate and the National Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery and so on, so that we can demonstrate the provenance of this work that we see as you know, part, of Britain's, um, part of Britain's history. And then there's the cultural um, effects which have followed from all this. And to me, that has actually been the most important aspect of our work. The ways in which particular ideas about racial difference became embedded and institutionalized in British society as well as in the Caribbean. So for the last years, uh, I've been working particularly on the 17th and 18th century Caribbean and the ways in which uh, British culture and society were racialized in relation to what was happening in the Caribbean. So what do I mean by racialization? Well, racialization is a social practice, a way of thinking and acting about particular groups of people which become institutionalized and embedded politically and economically and culturally. So we're all racialized as black, as brown, as white, whatever it might be. Groups recognized as having supposedly distinctive characteristics of skin color, of hair, of physique, of mental capacity, which are then organized hierarchically and inequalities are embedded from that. There is nothing natural about these distinctions. They're socially and economically and politically made, but they become part of the culture. They become embedded. They become naturalized as if they are natural. We've known for a very long time that there is no scientific or genetic basis to racial difference, but racism, as we also know, are part of everyday life. Well, as a historian, my interest is in how particular understandings of race and practices of racialization came into being in Jamaica in the 18th century and how they were then brought into England. So Englishmen in Jamaica, colonists, came to identify themselves as white. They didn't think of themselves as white when they went to the Caribbean. They thought of themselves as English but they recognize themselves as white, which they always use with a capital W, and they distinguish them between themselves. They demarcate themselves from Africans, from enslaved people that they call Negro. So white and Negro become the two terms, the language which is used to define the differences between uh, colonists and the enslaved. And it's the barbarism, they argue, that white people argue, that legitimates enslavement. It's because Africans are barbaric, it's because they come from a savage continent, that they can make African men, women, children into the human property of others. So they then define these patterns of, of racialization, get embedded uh, through laws, through politics, 
through cultural practices. So, for example, the children of, of enslaved women are defined as the property of the slave owner. Uh, slavery is defined as hereditary. And in that, they change the whole practice of inheritance as it was in early modern Britain, which is that it was the status of the father which defined the status of the child. And in slave societies, it becomes the status of the mother which defines the child, so that hereditary slavery gets established. They legislate through slave codes for different kinds of legal processes and different kinds of punishment for men and women and children according to whether they're enslaved or free. Whiteness becomes associated with freedom, blackness with slavery. The plantation is organized on the basis of both gendered and racialized hierarchies. Political power is only granted to white male property owners. Philosophical constructions are invented that define these differences as natural. So what we can see in 18th century Jamaica and in the writings and practices of slave owners in Jamaica at that time is how racialization happens. It's not something that's there before, it happens, it becomes embedded in economics and culture and politics. And then those ideas are transmitted to Britain and become part of uh, 18th century British understandings of race. Now I want to emphasize um, finally that these ideas and practices which were brought into Britain in the late 18th century, from the mid 18th century onwards, are specific to the Caribbean and African slavery, and that the ideas about racialization or the practices of racialization need always to be understood as historically and territorially and spatially specific. So Indian people are racialized in different ways from African people who are enslaved in the Caribbean. Uh, Jews are racialized in different ways again, and it's always historically specific. So part of the history that we've been hearing about that we need is these histories of the patterns of racialization and the ways in which they become institutionalized uh, in Britain. What we also need to know about is the ways in which they're challenged consistently over the centuries, just as we're seeing a challenge now um, but there are many continuities and this long history of inequality and injustice still is there for us to work with and challenge and hopefully to change. Thanks. William, thank you very much for that, Catherine. That was great. Um, again, I'm sure everyone is, is really loudly applauding behind their cameras. Um, but Eddie, are you ready to, to share the screen? Tech issues permitting. Yes, I am. Let's All right, I'm, I'm handing it over to you and Ishan because I've got, I've got nothing to contribute on the tech side. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, slideshow. Hi everyone, it's really nice to, to be here. Thank you, Ahmed and Ishan for the uh, invitation. I'm really happy to be alongside two colleagues I greatly admire. I'm definitely not an all-star yet, but um, Professor Bambara and Professor Hall are really, um, really all-stars and have inspired my work, and you'll see why. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about this book project that I'm working on, which is about the indenture period. And indentureship was, um, as Professor Bambra mentioned, um, uh, indentured labor was basically uh, a, a system that was created by not only the British colonial um, administration, but French and Dutch as well, to bring uh, laborers from different countries. But in, in this piece, I'm talking about Asia, where the vast majority of indentured labor in the British context um, came from. And it was a very exploitative um, and in many cases unconsensual um, 
a system of, of, of labor uh, that emerged as the possibility of filling the labor void left by, by slavery. Um, so I'll be talking about that system in the context of this book project, which is very specific. Um, and its, its aim is to kind of figure out how to tell the stories of indenture and particularly of those people who experienced indenture given that the archives around indenture are thin, deteriorating, and um, haven't been utilized, and this is, goes back to something um, Professor Hall said, haven't been utilized even though people know that they're there and they need to be resourced. So after the abolition of slavery, the British colonial territory, in the British colonial territories um, in the 1830s, the government prompted by a politician named Sir John Gladstone but inspired by earlier attempts to do similar things. Um, looked elsewhere for manual labor, primarily in agricultural production, but also in the means of facilitating that production. And while slave labor had been outlawed, this was seen as a humanitarian triumph that it would have been outlawed. Indentureship wasn't formally a system of captive labor, so that was an additional win for the British Empire in legitimizing uh, these projects of, um, of, of labor and industry. Um, so it could, be, it could be called something more humanitarian than, than slavery and distance from slavery in that way, or at least that was the political aim. So the outgoing voyage from India and China uh, to the various colonies would be recorded as a debt that had to be paid off. And this would be paid off between five, um, five to 10 years later, will be paid off in five years, and in 10 years, people were promised a return, um, a return trip. It's notable here that, you know, Gladstone was a slaveholder, and uh, it's notable that lots of people were paid out um, for, for the loss of, of labor, basically, um, the loss of, of slaves. And then the, uh, the indenture system kind of filled in the gap and the same people who were paid out or the same industries as well profited from this very exploitative system of labor. So it was just kind of a windfall after windfall. Important from my work, the contracts weren't only labor contracts, but they had implications on family law, immigration law, criminal law. Uh, so if you skipped work, you were potentially jailed um, or fined. And that form or mistreated um, by, by the owners of the plantation. And the contracts formed a basis for the state regulation of the lives, relationships, religious identities, family structures uh, of the indentured, aside from obviously their employment. And it's also important to underscore that the legitimacy of the indentureship system um, and its supposed consensual nature of being about debt bondage instead of ownership and its reform over the period of the 19th century. So occasionally there are things that were made better about it. So better provisions um, for safety and health were provided along in the ship journeys, but the ships were in many cases repurposed slave ships that were overcrowded, um, took a long time to get to, to port and the mortality rate was very high in the beginning. Reducing the mortality rate on the ships a little bit made the system seem more legitimate or it, would, it was presented as more legitimate and humanitarian. Um, but that is a, a way of um, kind of polishing the, the, you know, the handcuffs in, in, in other words, making the system seem more, more humane. So in terms of geography, the indentureship system recruited um, from South Asia, mainly from the northern part, so the northern India, uh, and it, regionally, this was from Eastern Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And that was about 85% of South Asians that were indentured to the various parts of, of uh, the British um, territories. And then about 15% were from the south and left through Madras. And then for the Chinese who were indentured, many of them left through um, what's now um, Guangzhou, so Canton, and Hong Kong. And this is just a port in uh, Calcutta where people left from called the Kitapur docks. And about, uh, fifth, uh, about one million, uh, one and a half million um, South Asians were indentured to various parts of uh, the French, Dutch, and British empires. About uh, a million were indentured in various parts of um, the British territories. 
my focus is on Jamaica, and only about 37,000 um, South Asians were brought to Jamaica uh, as indentured laborers. But obviously, there, for generations, many generations of people were, were um, toiling on the same plantations. So, uh, so many, many more um, Jamaican, uh, well, Indo-Jamaicans have worked um, in the indentureship era under similar conditions. But I'm focusing on Jamaica primarily because a lot of the research and a lot of the, the writing and investigation on indenture has been done about British Guyana or Trinidad, where um, there were larger numbers of people, but also, um, this is also something that Catherine Hall mentioned, uh, the integration or the racialization of people in various contexts is very different. The, the, the self-understanding of um, the, the South Asian diaspora in Jamaica is very different than it is in Trinidad and Guyana. And so the stories and the ways of relating to history are also different. And it's also where my family um, is from. So for all of these reasons, kind of my focus is on Jamaica. This is a ship register that I found in one of the archives. So before, before you know, the times of Corona, I was able to visit the archives in, in Jamaica, so the state archives and the archives in Calcutta. And just to note a little bit, the UK National Archives look like this, it's a broad, sprawling, you know, air conditioned, uh, very well kept environment, very well funded, uh, that holds quite a lot, but it, it holds mainly records that are, um, that are about British colonial correspondence between different offices, about commerce, about policy changes. So it's a sort of a high level of um, decision making, records about decision making. The State Archives of West Bengal um, hold colonial records that deal with uh, correspondence from the emigration offices there. So this kind of colonial administrative outpost um, there and those are similarly high level, but some of the correspondence is very localized. So the the stuff that they keep is very particular to Calcutta, and you can't find that anywhere else. But if you want to know about people's lives and um, and the individuals, if you want to know names of people, if you want to kind of get a a cross section of um, who was actually arriving in places, you need to go to the places that they actually arrived in. So that's the Jamaican National Archives. That's where we store the indenture documents. So indentures are contracts and each contract is an individual document. And on the front, there's all the information about the person and on the back are the terms of the contract. And they happen to be in English, in Hindi and in Urdu. And many of the people who signed the contracts could not read any written uh, text and they had to rely on um, agents who were typically privately contracted to explain to them the terms of the contract. Most people didn't know where they were going. They just knew that they were crossing the, the water and that also had significance. Um, so I'll talk about that more in the Q&A. But just to give you a very brief idea um, of why this is called Kalapani. So Kalapani in, in Hindi means black water or um, dark water is a way to, to think about it. Many of those who were indentured um, spoke uh, either Hindi or dialect Bhojpuri uh, from the northern, from Bihar and from Uttar Pradesh. And uh, the Kalapani has become a really important symbol um, and kind of metaphor for the journey and for, um, for the experience of going to a new place and, and losing ties with the old place. So. Uh, it's a kind of a Hindu belief system that if you cross the dark water, you lose ties to religion, to community, um, to place in society. But, uh, but the South Asian diaspora has, has kind of used this, even non-Hindus have used this as kind of a concept to think about um, the state of being in, um, as, a, as a descendant of indentured laborers, the state of being in these British overseas territories. So that's, I use it as a light motif to kind of understand what, what we are facing when we're doing our research as researchers on this, on this topic. Part of the reason as well is, as we've seen with the, the, the differences in how the archives are funded and kept, um, it's, it's really important to notice that that 
that kind of mirrors the colonial uh, project in terms of um, in terms of the material reality of how to engage with history. So uh, the materials that are largely not digitized, um, not in the best state, and despite some effort, they're still in danger of being lost to decay, accidental damage, and the colonial half-life of this racial capitalist project is just changing forms. And without being kept up, uh, we, we stand to lose the, the richness of that historical records that we have around um, these issues. Of course, historical records in the form of state archives are not the only way to understand indentureship, but it, it's, it's one of various tools that we can use as historians, but also as families looking for where we're from, looking for names, looking for how names changed and what decisions people made when they arrived um, in the mid 19th century. So I think that's an important point. I want to kind of spend the last four minutes or so just getting into some of these documents because one of the ways that I, I approach this project is to try to read the, the legal documents and these administrative documents that I find in a creative enough way to give, um, to ask questions of the records where those questions might not really be generated elsewhere. So what do the records, um, what kind of information do they supply about the discourses and the ideas that were being produced about the endangered people and how did that impact on their lives? So the management of the indentureship system uh, involved constant interventions by the colonial administration um, and communication between the colonial administration and the private entities that were contracting people to work. And there are a few documents I just want to um, talk about really briefly. So this document was one that actually refers to Mauritius. So while I'm looking at Jamaica, all the other um, the other places where people are indentured to are really important for piecing together the totality of how the colonial administration dealt with this system. So there were a large number of suicides among indentured laborers in Mauritius in 1872. And in these emigration returns in this document, the office attempted to analyze the figures. The report reads, out of 612 suicides reported to the police in the 10 years ending in December 1870, only 83 are attributed to jealous, jealousy, 26 to revenge, 28 to poverty, 189 to sickness, 82 to temporary insanity, 17 to ill treatment, and 217 to unknown causes. So this categorization does not even begin to deal with the conditions of life in the indenture system that were generally exploitative, but also in a context where language, a new social system, and uh, unknown future prospects of well-being were perpetually kind of uncertain and immediately relevant to people's lives. The report then goes on to contemplate um, why male suicides were so high when in India they weren't very high and the result, the conclusion was, oh, it must be homesickness, they must be homesick. So it's just interesting that all of these ways of conceptualizing of suicide, they were kind of, there's a taxonomy of ways to blame it on indentured um, laborers and to kind of try to psychoanalyze what they were going through without actually doing the work of understanding how the conditions were affecting them. So suicide was an easy way to do reporting about death that didn't put the onus on the system of indentureship because it was important to preserve the system of indentureship's legitimacy. Um, and a side note, a lot of the documents in the records are about death. So measuring death and talking about death uh, was a big part of determining whether the indenture, sy indenture system was working properly and whether it was legitimate. And I'll just give one other, um, one other document and then hand it back over to, to Amit. Um, this document is a kind of a notice, uh, a communication between the secretary of the Bengal government to the immigration department about compulsory detention of, of uh, South Asians who were derogatively referred to as coolies. And that term has a lot of meaning in different places. So we can talk about that as well. 
Um, so it's a short notice that mentions a person who was in a depot, likely having registered for labor in Mauritius, drowned in the then small offshoot flowing from the Hooghly River um, in Calcutta. And the assumption was presumably that it's not a large or a fast tributary, or it wasn't at that time, that the person must have jumped in with some sort of restraints on. And I imagine the reason that this letter was written was because it was to instruct people not to, or the, the depots not to hold or restrain uh, uh, would-be laborers against their will. And also to, to kind of softly indicate that it was a danger to them to, to hold them kind of in this, in this way near the river. Um, but the other underlying subtext is whether the person jumped or whether the person fell in by themselves. So it also leaves kind of some, some unknown, uh, the, the reason for, for the person's death unknown. Um, and there are other correspondences about this event that kind of indicate that the person was potentially, um, potentially in restraints that would have pre prevented them from swimming anyway. Uh, so it was, it's another kind of, there's, it leaves the question open of whether this was suicide, whether the person was unwell, whether the person was in restraints and shouldn't have been, um, but it never gets to the underlying um, issues of, of detention uh, on a boat, potentially for weeks or months, waiting for the boat to become full before it took off for the colony or the outpost, which was the case in, in, in many of these cases. They would just fill the boat and keep people there until it was ready to leave, um, which took weeks or months. So this, this type of analysis of, of these documents, of course, it's, it's not necessarily a new type of analysis, but um, because of the dwindling record and because death is such a central part of uh, the indentureship project and such a central reporting mechanism, in, in the documents, um, my goal with reading these documents is to try to draw out some of the connections that are hiding just between the surface and in between the lines. So I'll just hand it over now to, to Amit. Oh, brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that, Eddie. Uh, that was really good. And one of my friends texted me and said that your Hindi pronunciation put mine to shame, which is obviously <laughs> a lie. Um, but I want to say, like, because we've got to kind of wrap it up, just a massive thank you to our speakers. I thought that was, like, really, really uh, brilliant, to be honest. And I'm going to, well, I say I, I'm not going to do anything. Ishan is going to um, edit all these videos and put them onto the YouTube channel, which we're going to put in the, in the chat box again in a minute, which is Race in Britain. And I'd encourage anyone um, who's, like, maybe a teacher or whatever, to go on the site. We've actually um, put quite a few videos over there on the last couple of years about Black British history, BAME his British history, POC British history, whatever you want to, whatever acronym you want to put in front of it. Um, and including an event that we did with Gaminda actually last year about South Hall 1979. And I think it's a decent resource. Uh, uh, hopefully people will agree. If not, I don't know, go elsewhere on YouTube, maybe. But um, check that out and subscribe. Ishan's, Ishan's pushing me to push the subscribers. But we're going to keep trying to like chuck a few videos on there for people to look at. Um, when you're browsing the YouTube. Um, follow Consented on Instagram. Consented UK it is on Instagram. Uh, the Instagram's been, been popping off in, in, in light of recent events, uh, sadly, unfortunately. Um, and then, yeah, email. If you want to email me about the education project or anything, or even want to buy some site on your own, because I'd actually genuinely really encourage people to just like, yeah, if, they, if they're teachers or whatever, just to like give it a go. Because um, it is like, it's, it's quite fun. It's a good laugh, to be honest. Uh, uh, if nothing else, it's good fun to try and chat to young people about race and colonialism. You hear some really, some, some really provocative statements. I, in one class, we're like, what is whiteness? And a student said, it means having a thin nose because white people grew up in colder climates, so had more streamlined noses. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I thought that was an interesting take on the question at hand. But yes, email consentedukgmail.com. And then, yeah, give a virtual clap to all the speakers. But thank you very much for attending. And yeah, just check the YouTube channel after for the talks and stuff. So yeah, cheers, everyone. And bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.